Uh, hi everyone, uh, my name is Steve Gaynor and I am the Community Coordinator for SocialBizUG.org and I have with me today our Member of the Month, Mr. Jeremiah Benjamin. Uh, Jeremiah, how are you? Good, thanks. How are you, Steve? I'm doing very well. And I, I want to thank you very much for taking the time to do this for us. Absolutely. Thank uh, you. We always find these very interesting and enlightening. I hope so. <laughs> All right, so uh, let me start off by asking, um, tell me a little bit about yourself. Uh, what's your job title? What do you do for work? Uh, what does your company do? Basically, your elevator resume. Okay, sure. Um, yeah, my title is uh, Messaging and Collaboration Technologies, basically uh, an administrator type role uh, for you know email and uh, quicker and same time and uh, moving to connections at some point away from quicker. Um, and uh, a handful of other things. Um, I work at a company called Flexcon, and the the official the official uh, tagline, if you will, is uh, we're a global manufacturer of uh, adhesive coating, laminating, and finishing of durable materials used in graphic applications, electronics, and new products. From labeling on consumer goods like shampoo bottles or the automotive adhesives for airbag deployment to the protective film on a tablet or smartphone. Our products help differentiate brands. Uh, basically, it's uh, we manufacture pressure sensitive materials. I like to just call them huge rolls of plastic. Um, and it's for all different industries and all different markets. And uh, it's pretty crazy what uh, what our products end up being on or in. So it's uh, it's 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 pretty interesting stuff. Um, wow, that's very cool. Yeah, yeah. Um, all right, then, um, if you can talk about it, um, can, can you tell me about any recent successes you had, uh, what the challenges were uh, uh, on the project, and how you overcame them? Sure, yeah. Um, one of the recent successes I've had that I'm, I'm pretty excited about uh, is uh, Trilog's Project Zec software, which sits on top of Quicker or Connections, or I believe, uh, Smart Cloud as well. And it's for, uh, they call it Social Project Management. And uh, it took a few years to kind of get it in here. Um, I think corporate culture uh, being what it was, we didn't have a formalized project management system in place. Everyone kind of managed projects their own style, you know, Excel or whatever. <laughs> um, and so when we heard of Project Zec at first, uh, I kind of brought it in and demoed a few times with videos and uh, people were a little skeptical that it could work as well as it does. But uh, we, we slowly ramped it up we got people on board, and now it's really catching momentum, and people are asking, like, how do I get my project into Project Zach? So it's pretty, uh, pretty exciting. We're at that point now where it's, um, it's still building, but it's becoming very popular, and, and people know how to use it now. So, so it's really good. I'm, I'm pretty excited about that. Were you basically kind of a project manager for Project Zach? Uh, for, for your company, I mean. Yeah, I guess you could say that. I mean, I don't have the official title. Um, I guess I'm one of the people that kind of, uh, a lot of times I notice kind of a gap or a hole, and I try to I try to fill it. You know, it's one of those things where you, you can try to get to know your users. I guess I like to read users like you read a good book. You know, there's the text, and you read the text, and that's great. But to fully understand it, you have to have some context. Uh, what's going on around it. And then there's the subtext. It's what's not being said. It's what the, between the lines, kind of. So for this, no one came out and said, we need a project management solution. We need to formalize project management. I just saw, you know, I, I just saw a lot of gaps in the, in the project teams and, you know, some resources are being way overutilized. You know, people were working long, long weeks because they were tapped for every project because they're very good at what they do. Um, and so things like that started kind of coming up. So um, I guess we, and we looked at different things. We looked at Microsoft projects. We looked at some Excel plugins. We looked at uh, Basecamp, I think it's called the cloud one. And uh, but uh, Project X seemed like a natural fit. It's it's really pretty simple, pretty straightforward. And um, so yeah, I guess that's that was kind of my role to kind of bring it in. And now I've transitioned to training. And I'm trying to bridge the gap from you know the settings on the administration side to match the way that we work here and kind of make things consistent for the users and help them understand why certain things work the way they do and and that sort of thing. 
Excellent, and that makes uh, for a very nice segue into my next question, which is, how did you come to be a Notes developer? Uh, what career path brought you here? Yeah, well, I came by it honestly. Um, <laughs> I'm actually not a developer. Uh, I wish I wish I could code. I really do. Um, but uh, now in, uh, in in college, um, and I got my bachelor's degree. I was in a number of programming classes. I think I took data structures three times before I finally got through that. So now I'm more of an administrator, definitely. Um, if I do have to do coding, I try to find somebody else's work and you know steal that, borrow it, modify it, and then and then go from there. Um, so I'm definitely in the administrator side. I came to it from uh, I started off as an IT support person. Um, I actually started off in this same company as an as an intern in IT support and kind of worked up through the years over you know through the roles. Wow. One of the things I found when was um, helping the users was a, was a really big thing and. You know, giving a few tips and tricks really made a big difference in their lives. They could, you know, sometimes work faster. They, they could be more efficient. They could be more effective. And we were getting more value for the tools we already purchased. But then I discovered, you know, going around visiting every user by user, desktop by desktop, that's not the most efficient way to get the word out, or the best way to change a bunch of settings. So I started looking into the server side stuff. Um, started with, you know. Login scripts and group policies and things like that, but it wasn't really hit till I hit Domino. I think that I found that I could make major changes that could affect a lot of people very positively. So that's how I got to that point. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah. I think you're one of the few people that I've met that um, didn't actually stumble into Domino. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> You know, uh, uh, a lot of a lot of us are all self self taught people. Yeah. Yep. Um, all right. So uh, um, I, I was reading in one of your blog posts. Uh, it was called "Notify Your Internal Senders of Delays in a Reasonable Time Frame," yeah. uh, and you talk about IBM Protector yeah. and how to set it up. Now, there's one thing I was curious about. Um, uh, you said that you recommended uh, that the first delivery fail message doesn't get sent to the user for about 25 minutes and that to me seems like a long time. Uh, how, how, what leads you to choose those times and uh, can you share your reasoning on that? Sure, yeah, it's actually a pretty simple story and because I, I didn't really start in with Domino until 2007 or 8 um, and we've had it here since R4 I think in 1996. And as you know, Domino is very backwards compatible. So whatever settings they set back in 1996 were probably the same settings I kind of inherited, you know, 12 years later. Uh, so, so this may be going back to one of those archaic settings that in the 90s was perfectly acceptable. And I don't remember. This is over a year ago I made this change. Um, but I, basically, I had occasional complaints from users that they would get a bounce back. Um, you know. From a message they sent to, usually it was an important customer with a big contract or something, you know, really important. Um, and they get the bounce back, you know, 24, maybe 48 hours later. So, and I kind of said, well, it doesn't happen very often. I, I had other priorities at the time. I didn't really look into it. Well, we got Protector. I was looking through the manual, of course. And uh, I noticed the page on those settings, and I thought, this is a great opportunity to kind of fix that. Uh, I, I chose the particular settings I did because after talking to a few users, you know, 24 to 48 hours, whatever that, whichever window it was, was obviously way too long. But we determined that anything under half hour would be pretty acceptable. Um, you know, if they're, not, they're certainly not going to send an important email at, at 4.55 in the afternoon and go home at 5 and assume that the business deal closed. They're going to make a phone call if it's that close. So within a half hour, it seemed pretty reasonable. Uh, the other reason I chose those particular settings, when, as you said, it's a 25-minute delay before they get notified. Um, the settings we chose kind of have nice round numbers. It's easy to explain to users. And, um, and even after the 25-minute limit, Protective will try to deliver a couple more times. So even if they send it towards the end of the day, um, it might try to be delivered. And at the same time, being an email administrator, I was kind of a soft spot for these guys. Um, you know, sometimes your server goes down. Sometimes you have, you know, Windows updates. Um, sometimes your ISP goes down. Sometimes, um, we, you know, we used to have McAfee on our box, and that would freeze everything up for 10, 15 minutes. <clears throat> Excuse me. So sometimes there are, there are reasons that a server kind of goes offline for 5, 10, 15 minutes. And a 25-minute delay before being notified, I think, gives 
the receiving server or receiving server's admin some time to try to get things going again before you know a problem really gets flagged and people start panicking. So, so that's how we arrived at those settings. It seems to have paid off. Uh, the users, well, I shouldn't say they're happy, but I haven't heard complaints. So I guess we can assume that it's good news. Um, so and it's been it's been like I said, about a year, maybe over a year now, and uh, we've had those settings in place. It seems to have worked. No complaints is always good news. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. No <laughs> news is good news in this business. That's for sure. Yep. All right. So here it comes. Okay. This is the most important question <laughs> of the interview. What is your favorite movie and why? Well, uh, if you go by the last movie I've seen three times in a row, I have to say Frozen. Um, because I have, I have three kids under five. So, <laughs> But, of course, I haven't seen the whole movie in one long stretch. I get to see little pieces of it. Um, it's, uh, it's one of those things... Um, you know, when you have when you have kids, you don't really get to see movies too often. Um, but uh, I guess some of my favorite movies, going back a little ways, um, are a bunch of uh, B movies um, from a show called Mystery Science Theater Three Thousand. So I, I still have a handful of those on VHS, and every now and then, if I feel like staying up late, I'll pull one of those out after the kids are in bed, and I'll laugh my head off. So <laughs> Excellent, excellent. I love MST3K. That's yeah, exactly. <laughs> yep, yep, classic stuff. It's amazing the movies that bad come out and get to that point, but they do. They Yes, brilliant stuff. Yeah. All right, uh, I think that's about all the time we have. Uh, Jeremiah, thank you so much thank you, for taking the time to speak with me. I appreciate it, yes. Um, and everyone out there in socialbizug.org land, I hope to see you soon. Take care. Bye-bye, everyone.